passing the blame. Passing, he's making excuses and passing the blame. I mean, this is the oldest time, right? Adam and Eve did this. Um, you know, whenever we get into trouble, you know, we always start to look for an out. Got to be somebody else. It cannot be me. You know, it's rare to find someone who who is willing to uh, to take on the blame on themselves. And so Saul, uh, as Samuel said, "What have you done?" I mean, he immediately knows. Now, what was his reasoning? I believe by doing this, I'm going to gain God's favor. I'm trying. Isn't that interesting, right? I'm trying to get brownie points. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like Adam saying to God, you know, it's that woman you put here, you know. Um, he's saying, he's trying to bring God into this and say, I was just trying to, to get God's favor. Um, you know, I... Oh yeah, and he's blaming Samuel too. He's blaming everybody but himself. You know, um, you know, that's how compromise happens, isn't it? What, what does Paul say in 2 Timothy chapter 4? You may remember that. He says, Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering. Why? And so there's going to come a time when people will not endure sound doctrine, but they will heap up to themselves teachers who will tickle their ears. And, and so, uh, people make compromises with the gospel, with, with God's message, um, because they think they know better. I, I can't help but think about Abraham and Sarah. You know, Sarah says, you know, take, take my, um, um, uh, oh, what's the term? Um, handmaid. And, and, and go into her, right? You know, I'm just helping God out. You know, I'm just trying to make things easy. Why, you know, we, uh, we mentioned the other day that um, the, the idea of hell, uh, you, this was a poll, and uh, how, how accurate it is, I'm not sure, but I didn't get into the science of it, but they, they polled people on, on the doctrine of hell. You know, most people believe in heaven because, you know, it's pleasant to think about heaven. There's, that's nice, that's good, you know. But a majority of so-called Christians don't believe in hell. And why is that? Um, and, and so you, you have people who compromise things that they don't like to hear. Or they compromise to help God out. Um, uh, we, we brought the, uh, what was the excuse to bring in the musical instruments? You know, the original musical instrument was an organ in Kentucky. What was the reason? Anybody know that? Anybody know your church history? You know what the excuse was they gave? No, the preacher brought it in because he said the singing was so bad. They needed to help the singing out. Now, that to him sounded reasonable. Does it sound reasonable to God? No. And, and so you have Samuel here, I mean Saul, uh, making excuses, compromising uh, the Word of God. Um, and it's especially bad, why? Because he's king. Why would that be especially bad? What's that? He's the leader. He is the, the, the called for and cried out for king. And here he is almost immediately compromising one of the very most basic tenets of the Israelite faith, the law of Moses. Let's go on down to verse 13 and 14. Um, it says, and Samuel, so Saul gives his excuses. Samuel said to him, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God with which you uh, with which he commanded you, for then the Lord would have established your kingdom uh, over Israel forever. You know, what was the promise to him? What's the promise been to any of God's leaders? If you do what I say, you will be blessed. The same thing will be said about David. 
uh, to David. The same thing will be said to uh, Rehoboam and Jeroboam and uh, all the kings after. The promise is always the same. What is it? If you will follow the commandment, um, the law of Moses, if you will live faithfully, I'm going to bless you. What's fascinating is you get on later and we'll get into um, to the kings, but uh, you get to, um, oh, what's his name? Leave me. Uh, it's the young king. Um, uh, Josiah. Yeah, Josiah. You get to King Josiah. Um, you get to, uh, who was Josiah's grand, um, grandfather? Hezekiah. Uh, Hezekiah. Yeah, Hezekiah, you know, God had, had told the people, you know, he's going to punish them. Well, Hezekiah prays. Um, I'm getting myself confused here. I'll leave that alone. I'll come back to it. We'll get there eventually. I'm getting my. I had a point, but I want to make sure I'm right about it. I don't want to tell you wrong. But but there's been times when when God has relented, when when men have cried out for forgiveness and when they've shown real change. Uh, in Josiah's case, of course, they find the law in the temple and in, in the reconstruction, and and then of course he goes through and he destroys all the. Uh, even before that, he destroys all the. Um, the idol uh, altars and, and, and eliminates that evil uh, activity and, and then God begins to bless the southern kingdom um, and of course blesses them more because of his faithfulness. Um, and, and so God has always been faithful to keep his promises. Uh, it's unfortunate though as we as human beings don't always keep our end of the bargain. So Samuel said to Saul in verse 13, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God with which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. And now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And I want you to remember that. That's a key element to this whole thing. He, he is seeking after somebody after his own heart. Now, that later on gets applied to who? But initially, it's not given to any particular individual, is it? God says, and he, um, talking through Samuel here, is saying to Saul, if you had been that man, I would have blessed you. But of course, later on, like I said, um, this gets labeled on to, to David. Um, why would, but was David a perfect man? So when you use that phrase, a man after his own heart, he's not looking for a perfect individual, is he? And so one of the things I really want to get into when we get into David, and we start, I want to lay them out side by side, and I want to see the differences between two. Both men sinned. Both men had weaknesses. Both men were successful in certain areas. But what really made the difference was this one key element, was their heart. <coughs> Um, when Saul is faced with his sin, what does he do? Anybody else but me. When David is confronted in 2 Samuel chapter 12 by Nathan the prophet, when he gets to the end, he, remember he tells him about the, the man who, 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 who has the evil neighbor who comes and takes his beloved sheep to offer it to his guest. And then Nathan says, that man is you. What's David's response? And I think this is the key difference. He doesn't blame anybody else. He doesn't try to give it to somebody else. He says, I have sinned. And it's a big sin. I mean, it is a big sin. He had someone else killed. He committed adultery. A baby's going to die because of his sin. That's a big sin. Yet God was able to forgive him because his heart was still one that wasn't so hard that it could not be penetrated and softened and repaired. Saul, on the other hand, is, is just different. And um, he's just unwilling to submit to God fully. Uh, he says, he goes on in verse 14, And the Lord has commanded him... And prophetically looking ahead when he talks about the man after his own heart God has commanded him to be prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you All right, so you get here the first rejection uh, of Saul as king 
And then we go into another section I want to look at. I want to go to chapter 14. And, and so the first really big incident with Saul where he really breaks the commandment of God, of course, is the, the, the law concerning sacrifice. The second one comes in chapter 14. Uh, it's Saul's rash vow. Uh, let's go to verse 24. It says, And the men of Israel had been hard-pressed that day, so Saul had laid on an oath on the people, saying, Cursed be the man who eats food until it is evening, and I am avenged on my enemies. None of the people had tasted food. All right, so they're in the midst again of battle. And so Saul makes a vow. What's the vow? He says, nobody can eat food. Nobody eats until we win. Like that coach, you know, uh, who, who's... who's Team's having a bad practice. Nobody gets water until you play better or whatever. Nobody, you know, or whatever thing a coach puts on a team, right? Um, but I want you to notice something. In that vow, what's missing? Who can tell me? What's missing in that vow? No mention of God. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I want you to notice that. Curse be the man who eats food until it is evening. And I, I, King Saul, am avenged on my enemies. He, he's who's important to him. Right? Again, we go back. God is searching after a man what? After his own heart. And so he makes his vow. Go on a little bit later here. Verse 27. But Jonathan. Now who's Jonathan? Saul's son. Saul's beloved son. Right? And Saul's warrior son. Jonathan. Strong warrior. Commander. He, he's, he, has, he has a lot of victories. And he was a good man. He's going to become real important to the story of Saul and, and David. He's going to be kind of the interesting middleman. <laughs> um, but Jonathan had not heard his father's charge. One of the things that makes that vow, I mean, number one, what we talked about, he eliminates God from the vow. But the second thing that's really silly about it is they're divided up. They haven't come back together, right? And... And how is he going to communicate this to his other people? So Jonathan had not heard his father's charge. The people uh, had not heard his father charge the people with the oath. So he put out the tip of his staff that was in, uh, in his hand and dipped it in the honeycomb and put uh, his hand in, uh, to his mouth and his eyes became bright. I think it's interesting the Bible the, the writer of Samuel there is very descriptive. He does this, and he does this, and he does this. Um, what's the emphasis there on his eyes became bright? Yeah, that's good tasting honey. Man, when you're hungry, and you get something sweet, right? Um, verse uh, 29, he goes on. He says, Then Jonathan said, uh, so, so he does this and finds out what's happened, uh, that, that his father's done this vow. Jonathan, verse 29, says, My father has troubled the land. See how, um, uh, let's see. No, he hasn't heard about it yet, I don't think. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, so my father has troubled the land. See how my eyes have become bright because I tasted a little of this honey. Now that seems to actually be a physical condition, doesn't it? It's not just that it tasted good. But his eyes have become bright. I wonder what that is. That's fascinating. I don't know the answer to that question, to be honest with you. Um, uh, but but he, he, he notices something different um, about himself. Um, could it be that, that he's been marked by the vow of his father? Um, how much better if the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemy that they found. For now the defeat among the Philistines has, has not been great. Okay, and so 
Uh, they're in this battle. They're not winning. Um, it's been difficult. The people are hungry. I mean, he takes that one bite and, and, and you know, and he remembers how hungry he is. Uh, then you go down to verse 31, and it says, They struck down the Philistines that day at Michmash and uh, Ajilon, and the people were faint. Why were they faint? Eating. Who's going to send soldiers to war and not give them something to eat? Um, the people pounced on the spoil and took the sheep and oxen and calves and slaughtered them on the ground and the people ate with the blood. Now there's another thing here. Um, I think it's interesting to note how Saul's one rash vow has led to a bunch of other problems and how it just gets worse. So you have Jonathan break the vow. Jonathan realized how hungry the people are. And then out of their hunger, what do they do? What was the commandment uh, of God concerning blood? You do not eat blood because the life is in the blood, right? And God was very distinct about that. And... Um, and, and, and here they are eating the blood. Uh, again, uh, one thing compounding another. Um, goes down to verse 33. Uh, then they told Saul, Behold, the people are sinning against the Lord by eating the blood. And he said, You have dealt treacherously. Roll a great stone to me here. And so uh, he takes the stone in verse 30, uh, 35. Uh, he builds an altar to the Lord. It was the first altar uh, that he built to the Lord. Um, and then in verse 36, I'm going to kind of go through these quickly. If you have a question, you can raise your hand. Um, then Saul said, Let us go down after the Philistines by night and plunder them until the morning light. Let us not leave a man of them. And they said, Do whatever seems good to you. But the priest said... Let us draw near to God. So you have a contrast here between the priest and the people uh, who are led by Saul. What's this contrast? The priest wanted to inquire God, and Saul was not having much of that. He wasn't. Yeah, and, 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 and so they're like, let us go to God. Okay? And so Saul does that. Verse 37. Uh, Saul inquired of God, Shall I go down after the Philistines? Will you give them into the hand of Israel? But he, God, did not answer him that day. So he gets no answer. And so he becomes perplexed. Um, a little bit later on, you go down to verse 43. And so Saul knows something's wrong. God's not answering. We're not doing very well. The people are sinning. Uh, they sin by eating the blood. You know, you've got all this going on. And again, remember the character of Saul. Who's the character of Saul? When he's in trouble, does he take ownership of it? No, he looks for somebody to blame. Uh, verse 43 then Saul said to Jonathan, Tell me what you have done. And Jonathan told him, I tasted a little honey with the tip of the staff that was in my hand. Here I am, I will die. And Saul said, God do so to me, and more also, you shall surely die, Jonathan. Um, Jonathan knows his father's acted rashly, but what's his response to it? Right. You put me in this situation, but I, here I am. Well, Saul said that whoever was caught in the sin would die. So he pronounced sentence before he knew who the culprit was. And so Jonathan was ready to die. Um, who was the judge who, um, or the man, maybe it wasn't a judge, but who was the man that said, you know, if God had given me this victory, 
uh, I'll sacrifice the first thing I see when I get home. And his daughter is the one that comes out to greet him. Jephthah. Jephthah. Yeah, it's Jephthah. Um, and, you know, acting very rashly, right? He didn't think that out through. I mean, instead of saying, God, you know, I'll give you ten goats or, or t you know, ten of my best sheep or, or whatever, right? He, he just throws it open there. He had not thought it through, has he? Um, now, the context there, when you go to Jephthah, the context may be that he didn't actually sacrifice his daughter, which God is very against sacrificing children on an altar, uh, even adult children. Um, most likely what happened was his daughter went to serve uh, in some capacity with the priest or, or something like that. But uh, it's sort of like uh, with Samuel himself. You go back and study it. I'm not getting into that tonight. That's, um, but, but just acting really rashly. Well, Saul again, acting very rashly, looking for somebody else to blame. And, and he tells his son, Jonathan, you're going to have to die for this. Now, it's interesting, the people's reaction. Now, Jonathan has been successful in his battles. He's grown. Uh, he has a reputation among the people. Uh, he's, uh, they have a certain connection to him. Verse 45, when the people hear uh, what Saul says, the people said to Saul, Shall Jonathan die? Who has worked this great salvation in Israel? The people took note of who was winning these victories, right? Um, far, uh, far from it. As the Lord lives, there shall not one hair of, of his head fall to the ground, for he has worked with God this day. So the people ransomed Jonathan so that he did not die. Then Saul went up from pursuing the Philistines and the Philistines went to their own place. Who went defeated? Who went home defeated that day? Saul, Saul did. Why? And he got no victory out of it. Remember what was the original vow about? Nobody eat until what? Until I've, I've conquered my enemies. Until my enemies have been defeated, right? He wanted that victory. And he hadn't had it. And, and then even with this, the people ransomed. Uh, I think that's interesting there. The people ransomed Jonathan. Um, and, and so there again, you, you have Saul being muddled in, in defeat. Again, by his rashness, by his own self-pride. Uh, and then we go on to chapter 15. Any questions about any of this so far? All right, let's go down to, uh, let's go to chapter 15, verse 1. And Samuel said to Saul, all right, so Samuel um, uh, comes back to Saul. Saul, is, he's not had a good run of it here lately. And, and it's all his own fault, but he, he's still not had a very good run of luck. But Samuel comes to Saul and he says, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people Israel. Now therefore listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what uh, Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way uh, when they came up out of Egypt. You, you go back to the book of Exodus and you can read about that, that interaction. But uh, they, were, they were unkind uh, to the Israelites. And so uh, punishment is finally coming. And so he says in verse 3, Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. So what is God's very explicit command? Devote. Everything for destruction. I mean, you think about it. Um, when they went through Jericho and God said, destroy everything. There were specific things that he said to be kept in the treasury, but everything else to be devoted for destruction. And of course, uh, Achan decides to keep a little bit for himself. It causes the, the, the defeat. Here again, God being very direct, very explicit in his instructions. All right, what happens? 
A little bit later in verse 8, it says, And he took uh, Agag, so he's went in. Uh, he's finally got that victory, right? <laughs> he's finally got that victory. Mm. What's he going to do with it? And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive. And devoted destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. And Saul and the people spared Agag, Agag um, and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatted calves and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. Well, they do. They go in, they have this impressive victory. It's almost like he's kind of getting a little bit of a second shot at things and what does he do? The exact opposite that God had told him. Now he kills all the people except for the king. But then all these other things. Notice what happens. He was warned, wasn't he? Verse 10, the word of the Lord came to Samuel. Verse 11, now notice this. Um, I regret that I have made Saul king. Uh, you know, you can't help but think about Genesis 6. What does it say? I am sorry that I made mankind. I am sorry that I made Saul king. I regretted that I made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And Samuel, notice Samuel's reaction. And Samuel was angry, and he cried to the Lord all night. You know, the other side of this is the, the side we never talk about is, is Samuel. You know, Samuel was a judge and was a good judge. He's a good man. He was faithful to God, and he did a lot of good things for Israel. And what did Israel do? They rejected him. They threw him aside, wanted a king. He, he got over that. He did what God said. He anointed Saul king. And now, what's he seeing? What's he going through all over? Or going through now? He's seen this man that... I'm sure he, he's developed a friendship with Saul. Uh, he, he's seen Saul grow up a little bit. Um, and he's watched him have trouble. And, and yet, he can't help how he feels, you know. He has this connection to him. And he was angry. And what was he angry at? You know, he's probably angry at Saul. He's angry at the situation. And he says he cried all night long. And then in verse 13, he goes to Saul. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be, the, uh, blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. No, do you hear what he just said? Now we know what happened, but notice how he responds. He says, I have done what God has commanded me. This man has a skewed vision, doesn't he? Verse 14, Samuel said, what is then, what then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen that I hear? Are you crazy, man? <laughs> I can hear them. Saul. They have brought them from them. What's he doing? What's he doing? They have brought them from the Amalekites. For, um, for the people spared the best of the For the people has spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to, fact, to sacrifice to the Lord your God and the rest we've devoted to destruction. He's doing again what he always does. 
Verse 16. And Samuel said to Saul, Stop! It's almost like when somebody is in this cycle of denial. And you just have to shake them. Like, wake up! Don't you see? Don't you see what you're doing? Stop! Yes, ma'am. I think so. He also said he's going to sacrifice it to the Lord your God. Yeah. That's John Rowe Anderson. He doesn't see himself connected to, you know, I'm doing this for your God. Yeah. Because he doesn't know what he's doing. Spiritually, where is he? Well, he's not doing it for the Lord. He's doing it for He's not a spiritual person. He doesn't feel connected to God because he hasn't devoted himself to God. In Acts chapter 6, when they decide they need to select seven men, who do they define as those seven men? Men what? Full of, full of, full of the Holy Spirit and have faith. You know, people who are going to lead God's people, number one should be what? Fully devoted to God, number one. He's just simply not. And then um, he says, Stop! I will tell you what the Lord has said to me this night. And he said, Speak. I'm going to quickly, I know we're done, but let me just um, do this here. Uh, then why did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what is evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on a mission on which the Lord sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek. And I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the people took the spoil, this, um, the, um, the spoil, uh, sheep and oxen, the best of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God at Gilgal. And Samuel said, has the, Lord, has the Lord as great a delight in burnt offering and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as sin, it, it is as the sin of devi deviation and presumption as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. We'll get into the final few verses here. I have just a little bit more left, but we'll get into those next week. But it's just a really sad, sad story. A sad series of events in the life of Saul. We'll pick this up next week. Go ahead and read uh, the next few chapters, if you will. Thank you.